Good evening, everyone. There may still be some people that still join us as we get started, but I think it's about time that we, we go ahead with our, our event tonight. So for the people who don't know me, I'm uh, Dr. Adroni Verbrugge. I'm the clinical nutritionist here at OVC. I'm the Royal Canin and Dow Chair in Canine and Freedom in Clinical Nutrition. I joined OVC about uh, a little bit more than three years ago now. I immigrated from Belgium where I did my DVM, my PhD, and my board certifica uh, certification in nutrition. So um, our event tonight is all about obesity, as you have seen on the uh, invite already. So first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody who is present here today with us at OVC, but also our people who are joining us online, uh, as we will be streaming this presentation live online. Uh, I also like to thank Hills um, because it wouldn't have been possible without them to make this event happen. And I especially like to thank uh, Dr. Kimberly Stewart, uh, who is uh, with Hills and who is present here with us today. Um, thank you, Hills, for your ongoing support and also for um, the Hills Pet Nutrition Primary Healthcare Center. Um, the agenda for this evening, um, first of all, uh, Dr. Morantal Gavriel will, start, uh, will come to the floor and we'll start with her talk. Uh, Dr. Morantal Gavriel is a DVSC student in uh, clinical nutrition and she is doing a residency for the European College of Veterinary and Comparative Nutrition. So she will be talking to you about how obesity is related to disease and how we assess the obese patient. After that, I will come to the floor and I will discuss with you how to design a diet plan for overweight animals. And then to finish up the evening, Dr. Tiffany Dursey, um, who is uh, certified in rehab, acupuncture, and pain management, and is working for the uh, OVC Fitness and Rehab Service at the Hills Primary Healthcare Center. Um, she will come to the floor and talk a little bit more about obesity, exercise, activity, rehab, that kind of thing. So just that you get the whole package on how to manage your patients from the diet side of things and the exercise type of things. So I think we can get started with inviting Dr. Morantal Gavriel so she can start with her, her talk. So let's help welcome me, um, Dr. Morantal Gavriel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Verbrug. Do you guys hear me well? Yes, okay. Guess I'll just hold this and I hope that you do hear me. So good evening everyone again. So obesity is actually a global problem. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, so obesity is a global problem uh, and it is the most common nutritional disorder. Now in the fifth annual uh, veterinary survey in 2012, conducted by the American, by the Association of uh, Prevention of Obesity, it was found that dogs are more priv are prevalent to 53% uh, of becoming obese or overweight and cats are more prevalent by 55%. So the definition is the accumula defi definition. I'm sorry of obesity is the accumulation of excessive amounts of adipose tissue, where the energy intake is bigger than the energy requirements. Now this definition specifically does not take into consideration obesity as being a risk factor. So another definition may come handy, where obesity should be defined as the excessive body fat that is associated with disease, or the increased risk of a disease. Now, 5% over the normal body weight would be considered as being overweight, where 20% 20, 20 would be considered uh, as being obese. There are many predisposing factors that you know of, like diet and feeding method, uh, signalment, like there are, there are breeds that are more predisposed to becoming obese, gender, if the animal is spayed or neutered, uh, the age of the animal, activity and lifestyle, which Dr. Dursley will speak about uh, later on, uh, medication, endocrine, and genetic disorders. So obesity is also a low-grade low inflammatory state. It is comprised of two components. First would be the white adipose tissue, which acts as an active endocrine organ. Now, in uh, humans and in rodents, more than 100 adipokines have been recognized, including hormones, cytokines, chemokines, um, acute phase proteins, etc. 
Now, the, the white adipose tissue is actually the one, what is one of the organs that produces this adipokines and secretes them, where weight loss has shown to reduce this secretion. In a recent feline study, it was shown comparing um, chronically obese cats to lean cats, uh, it was showing that there are some alterations in mRNA expression of adipokines and in the morphology of the adipose tissue. Actually, it was shown that the adipos adipocyte cell size is increased with obesity, and again, there are some alterations in the uh, gene expression of the adipokines. So the second component would be the gastrointestinal tract permeability. Now, gastrointestinal, now, there have been recent studies, again, in human and rodents that showed already that uh, bacteria products are very, much, um, are very much related to the inflammatory process associated with obesity. So once we, had, um, once we do have a, a problem like the host fails to manage the microbiome due to genetic or environmental reason, reasons, we do have uh, inflammation. So in rodent, study, rodent studies suggest that actually, um, I'm sorry, rodent studies suggest that once, we, once the, the host fails to manage the microbiome, as I mentioned, obesity occurs, but it's mostly due to uh, alteration in the protein expression of the uh, gastrointestinal barrier. And once the barrier is actually damaged, we can have bacteria products, we can have bacteria toxins uh, getting inside and causing th those LPS can cause whether local or more systemic inflammation. Now, generally talking about inflammation and about obesity, I will, it's, much, it's much related to my study project and I will talk about this later on. Now, also talking in general about obesity and inflammation, so there are many health complications and implications due to it. So, obesity is very detrimental to our pets and there are many related health consequences, like many diseases that occur because of it, like diabetes mellitus, insulin resistance. We have different kind of orthopedic diseases like osteoarthritis, and different other diseases. The most common, I would say, implication that we can put our finger, fingers on would be, one would be the lifespan of the animal itself. So in Achilles study, which was um, the first one to assess longevity in a larger mammal than rodent. In 2002, 48 eight weeks old Labrador retrievers were taken and they were divided into two groups. From each group they took one dog and paired it to the other. Now one dog was fed ad lib where the other one was restricted by 25%. So the results showed that the, the obese group actually aside to having a higher fat deposition, uh, they were also having more ortho orthopedic problems throughout their lives in, a, in, a, in an earlier stage, but they also had a shorter lifespan. Actually, those who were restricted showed to have a two years average more lifespan than the obese ones. So the other implication would be the quality of life, which is something that we really want to emphasize to our clients in clinic. So in a, previously, in a previously validated quality of life questionnaire um, on, obe on obese dogs, uh, which is the HRQOL in here, uh, it showed that dogs, obese dogs that did not go through a weight loss plan or failed a weight loss plan uh, showed lower score on this questionnaire comparing to dogs who actually went through a successful weight loss plan. Those dogs that were successful in a weight loss plan showed increased vitality, decreased emotional disturbance, and decreased pain. So now talking about the practical, the more practical aspect of uh, assessing obesity, the nutritional assessment itself should be made on every pet at every time point. Nutritional assessment guidelines uh, emphasize that good nutrition enhances pet quality and quantity of life. Now the WASAVA, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, has established some sort of like five, vital, um, five vitals that should be incorporated into the physical examination in every pet. So it includes temperature, 
cardio function, pulse, respiratory health, pain, and the fifth vital sign is, is included as nutrition. So the nutritional assessment is very much of an iterative process and each factor should be assessed and reassessed over time again and again. Now these factors are most commonly referred to as the circle of nutrition. Now the circle of nutrition includes three factors. It's the animal specific factors like age, uh, the physical state of the animal itself, uh, activity level, diet specific factors like uh, if we have some sort of like unbalanced nutrient profile, if we have spoilage, contamination of the diet. And the third factor would be the feeding management and environmental factors that include mostly, like mostly um, owner behavior in regards to feeding method, frequency, um, environment itself of the feeding. So the nutritional assessment itself, uh, the oral part includes two, two parts. First would be the screening evaluation, which is a preliminary evaluation. And the second one would be the extended evaluation. Now the screening evaluation is conducted on every pet, on every patient. It is part of the history taking and the physical examination. And it includes the assessment of all those factors that I was talking to you about, the circle of nutrition. Now you should really pay attention to um, to those low high activity levels, if we have multiple pets in the home, if, we have, if, the, if the animal is gestating or lactating, if it's younger than one or bigger than seven, and of course specific, if it has specific risk factors that are known to influence the nutritional stasis. Now this would be, uh, by the Wasava, the handout that includes this initial screening evaluation checklist. Now once we have, as you can see in here, the physical examination, we have the body condition score. Even once we have it bigger than five, we straight ahead have to go to the extended nutritional assessment. This is a summary, just, just shows us again. If we have no risks, no further uh, action required. However, if we do find a nutritional risk factor present, like obesity, having a body condition score bigger than five, overweight or obesity, I mean, then we have to do the extended nutritional assessment. So for the extended evaluation, um, the animal is identified, as you can see, uh, to be at risk, as I mentioned. Now it's based on the screening evaluation, and it, su it suggests that nutrition plays a very major role uh, in the development of or the management of the underlying disease. From this going to the clinical history, which we said that the screening uh, part is part of this, is part of the history, then we have the presenting complaint, we have the, we have the overview of the medical problems of the animal, we have uh, medication that are given to the animal, we have fluctuations in body weight or body condition or muscle condition score, we have changes in, in appetite over time that we can, all this information we can get from the owner, and of course, one important, very important thing is the dietary history. So the dietary history is a comprehensive summary, as you can see, of the diet fed and the form of it. So it's not just the canned versus the dry, it's also the homemade diet um, that can be part of it. Now, the amount fed is very, is very, very important in that point. Uh, and also the amount that is actually uh, offered by the owner, if it's ad lib. So it's the feeding frequency and method, the feeding environment, uh, eating, drinking habits, supplements, medications, uh, treats. If they are bigger than 10%, it will unbalance the nutrient profile. Now, in regards to human foods, uh, if we have a patient that is fed some sort of human foods, whether it's a homemade diet, or whether it's human foods as treats like table scraps, we can actually assess the calories and the nutrient profile coming from it through the USDA database, which is in here, the link in here. So before going into the physical assessment part, I just wanted to show you a quick little video. Hey, is this Maxus? He's, um, he's changed. Yeah. He's, uh, he's just, he, he looks extra fluffy, you know? Oh no, that's a soda cup. 
Is this is this hard snug? I mean, it looks it's it's gotten it's, tight. Yeah, I'm telling you, Doc, that thing is shrinking. <laughs> that's one. That's an explanation. Um, so, do you guys have do you, um, do, you do uh, physical stuff? <laughs> yeah, we um, do stuff like stuff with table scraps or other <laughs> stuff. What are you? Uh, do you think he's getting big? When you compare him to other animals. <laughs> oh, okay. So, I showed you this video because I started it being a bit funny, but it's very, it's very true. I think like in everyday life that it, we find it kind of hard to uh, tell the owner that their pet is obese because we don't really know how they're going to accept it. But aside to this, we need some sort of way to, um, to portray to the owner that their animal is obese or overweight. And this is done by using the body composition measurements. So in research settings, we have the DEXA. However, in clinical settings, we have the body condition score, of course, the body weight. But the body condition score, we have a 5, a 6, and a 7 and a nine point system, scoring systems. We have the muscle condition score, we have body mass index, we have body fat percentage, and we have gross circumference. So just a bit about the DEXA. It's X-ray it's X-ray based bone densitometer uh, using energy, and it's embedded differently by bone, fat tissue, and lean, lean tissue. So it gives you the, the um, proportional percentage of each one, and it's been validated uh, to carcass composition of the dog and the cat. Now, the, thing, the good thing about it, that it's of course the gold standard in all species. However, there are some, some problems, like the first one um, would be uh, the first that it requires sedation. And the second one would be that it's actually very expensive, so we can't really use it in clinical settings. However, as I mentioned, it's been validated against uh, carcass composition of dogs and cats. Therefore, we can, we can definitely use the body condition scoring system. Now, this is the Wasava handout for body condition scoring system. I hope you can see because I think it was clearer on my laptop. The thing is with this, it's very, very good because it gives you a description of each one of the, com of the body condition scoring. And this is something you can actually show to the owner. So usually what I do when I try to give them you know, an explanation of how I assess their body condition score, I try to walk with, it, with the owner to try to actually let them feel their pet as well. If I'm saying, listen, I can't really feel the ribs, and it correlates to, let's say, uh, body condition score seven or eight, then I let them feel it as well. And it just gives them an estimation that what we're saying is true, and it's not just something we just invented. So it's very important, especially with the communication with the client. Now, talking about muscle condition score system, so we have, uh, we have four points we usually evaluate. As you can see, we evaluate the temporal muscles, we evaluate the shoulder area, the scapula, we evaluate the apoxial muscles in here, and the pelvic and hind limb area in the cat and in the dog. So the thing that is important to always remember is that body condition score is definitely different than muscle condition score. Since we can have obese patients, even very obese patients, which their muscle condition score would be very, very deteriorated. And it's just a matter of getting that feel to it. Now, we can also have patients who have, uh, for example, uh, cats who have uh, hepatic lipidosis. They would, be, they would be very cachectic, but they would be still obese. And we can have Labrador Retriever that had a ruptured cruciate that would have a more localized muscle deterioration. So talking about morphometric measurements, we have different kinds that you can actually do in your practice, uh, like body mass index and body fat percentage. However, the more common ones that you're probably more used to is the Hills Healthy Weight Protocol morphometric measurements. So in the dog, we have uh, four morphometric measurements that are within 10% of the DEXA value in 80% of the patients. And this is the website you can actually go in and implant your, um, your measurements in this. 
And in cats, we have six points uh, that are within 10% of the DEXA value um, in 87% of the patients. Now, however, if someone could, does not have this e-tool, does not have it available to him, or he feels that the pad is less compliant to do those morphometric measurements, since cats are, are, are less compliant, I suppose, like in many things, then he can go and do, uh, and he can go and use the Hills Body Fat Index, BFI, risk chart for dogs and for cats as well, to kind of predict the body fat percentage and the ideal body weight. Now the last part of the nutritional assessment would be going through the fecal scoring system. Since we don't really want the owners to start using food descriptions as fecal scores for us, we can show them this chart and just have a baseline on how, how, on how their feces look like in the beginning before we alter their diet. So from talking about feces and obesity and inflammation, I would like to ask a bit for your help on my research. My research is about the impact of treating obesity on the fill and fecal microbiome, and I would very much appreciate your help in enrolling patients to the study. So the objective of, this, of the study would be, <laughs> yeah. The objective of the study would be to evaluate the effects of a standardized feline weight loss program on the feline microbiome and on biochemical indices. Now we would require 20 obese cats and 20 lean cats as control. So the obese group would include healthy cats other than being obese with a body condition score equal or bigger than 8 out of 9. The lean group we would only need the healthy cat. Now, the age would be two to seven years old. However, that's the preferable range. We can, we can try to make exceptions if required to someone who's older, unless, of course, considering they are healthy. Now, they should be fed separately from other pets in the household, and they do like dry food. They're preferably from the Guelph uh, surrounding area, or they're willing to travel biweekly to the hospital. For the exclusion criteria, uh, we would need outdoor, we would not need an outdoor cat. Um, and of course, a cat that has clinical signs of systemic disease or abnormalities on blood work uh, prior to enrollment, or the cat received medications 90 days prior to enrollment, then this is something we cannot have. So a bit about the experimental design, and this is a really, really, really very very good for both the owners and the cat for everyone. Like it's a really good um, experiment, good study since it does promote weight loss. Um, so we have we have a four week adaptation period and we have a ten week weight loss plan by itself. So for the four weeks, the lean cats and the obese cats would be into it. Uh, like both of the groups would be into it. However, the obese cats would continue to do the weight loss plan for ten weeks. Now, prior to the adaptation period, we would take a diet history from the owners, and on three time points, we would collect blood and do body composition assessment. Now, on the end of the four-week adaptation period, and from there on until the end of the study, we will collect feces biweekly by the owners, just through, you know, like uh, feces cups, nothing very complicated. So they would be required to fill out a diet history form. Uh, to measure food with a gram scale, uh, to keep a food log, and to come for a biweekly evaluation of body weight or body condition score, which we can accommodate and I will explain shortly. There would be biweekly collection of feces and blood collection in three time points, as I mentioned. So now for the good part, for the perks of the study. So they would get physical exam, CBC and biochemical profile, constant monitoring during the study in regards to the weight loss. Now, of course, all of those, especially if you refer them to this specific study for that purpose, we would update you, we would keep you updated, and then you can also continue with those, uh, with those obese cats afterwards in their um, diet plan. We would also give them a feline weight loss veterinary diet for the duration of the study, which means they would have uh, food at, with no expense for about three months. And we would do biweekly house calls uh, for body weight and body condition score if required uh, for the patients that are living within Guelph. So I would like to thank you for your assistance and for listening. And I would take any questions if you have.
So I would like to give the stage to Dr. Verbrook. Are there any questions now for Moran? Or otherwise it can wait until later in the presentations as well. Just have to switch presentation, so if there would be any questions, we definitely have time for it. Um, not wearing my glasses. <laughs> Where's the slideshow thing? In the beginning, okay. And I always forget to wear pants with this kind of microphone. <laughs> okay, so do you hear me good? Yep. Okay. Um, so Moran already explained a little bit about patient assessment of the obese patients. So I thought it was about time that we just kind of put this into practice and look at the at a first case. Um, so this case is Alma. Alma is a golden retriever who is female spade, six years old. And Alma came in with uh, typical complaints. The client said that Alma doesn't eat very much, but is still gaining a lot of weight. Um, the dog doesn't have a lot of activity and is also sporadically lame on the right front leg. The coat doesn't seem very healthy either, like it's dull and scaling. And the owner already tried a couple of times to, um, to make Alma lose weight, uh, but hasn't been very successful with it at all. So at today's uh, measurements, uh, Alma is 44 kilograms and has a body condition score of nine out of nine. Um, at the age of one and a half years, she was 27.5 kilograms, and according to the owner, that was a good body weight at that time. Um, the weight gain all started after the spay, which is very typical since spay neutering really reduces the energy requirements with about 30% in dogs and cats. So one of the big challenges that you have when it comes to designing a weight loss plan is really um, how do I estimate or how do I determine that ideal body weight of that pet? And there are a number of different ways uh, that you can do it. Of course, all have some kind of limit, all have benefits and limitations to it. One of the best ways to actually do it is if you do your nutritional assessment in every pet every time, like from puppy, kitten, until later on in, in your life, maybe you can just go back to your medical record and see if you can find that recording of a healthy body weight, a body weight associated with a body condition score that is a five out of nine. And then you don't have to do any calculations at all because you have recorded it in your medical record. Also, some people say, well, go back to when the patient was one year of age. Usually when they're one year of age, they're not fat yet, um, but there are many exceptions to that rule already. You have quite a lot of animals, dogs and cats, that are already chubby at one year of age. So it could be something that could be helpful, but definitely not in every patient. Breeding standards, sometimes you can go back to the breeding standards if it is a um, purebred dog and just check, well, what is the body weight range for this specific breed? One of my colleagues in the Netherlands actually attended one of the big dog shows in, um, in Amsterdam, and he did body condition scoring in all the dogs that attended the show and that were actually part of the competition. And he noted that when it was breeds that were predisposed to obesity, like Labradors, Golden Retrievers, Pucks, Beagles, all the typical breeds, that those dogs tended to have a body condition score that was slightly higher even if their body weight was still within the breeding standards. And then the other way was true as well, like for whippets and greyhounds, that kind of breeds where they are always a little bit, when we like them more thin, uh, those animals had body condition scores that were slightly underweight, yet they also still were perfect within the breeding standards. So you have to be a little bit careful with breeding standards as well, because for the breeds that are predisposed towards obesity, breeding standards may be actually overestimating the body weight a little bit. 
There are a lot of uh, web-based calculation programs available. The Hills Haiti Weight Protocol is one of them. Um, Royal Canin and Purina also have a similar one. Um, also, VIN has a calculator as well. So there's definitely a lot of calculation programs. Um, I agree with some of them. I, agree, I don't agree with all of them. The VIN, VIN calculator is one that I don't like at all when it comes to uh, treating obesity. Uh, they are, and we will talk more about designing the diet plan, but they are using current body weight instead of ideal body weight to do the calculations, and they're not using the right energy requirement either. So you're actually giving too much food for weight loss when you're, feeding, when you're using the VIN calculator. Um, what we actually do in our clinical nutrition service, we calculate the ideal body weight based on the current body weight and the body condition score. And that is actually what is happening, like if you look at the healthy weight protocol, that is actually happening behind the scenes of that program as well. So when you're looking at uh, body condition scoring systems, um, I prefer to use the nine point system because that nine point system is really the one that is validated. Um, if you're using the five point systems, usually people use halves as well, which is exactly the same as using a nine point system. So you're just making your five point into a nine point. So if you're looking at overweight animals, well, let's look at the ideal body condition scoring first. So an ideal body condition score is like four out of nine to five out of nine. And a five out of nine means that the animal has 20% body fat. If that animal is obese, with every score, that you, with every point of the score that you go higher, you're actually adding 5% fat. So a six out of nine is 25% fat. A seven out of nine is 30% fat. 35, and then when we come to the nine point score, you just say more than 40. And that's where our difficulties are. Once we have those obese animals that come in that are really morbidly obese, we don't know anymore, is it a 40? Is it a 45? Is it a 50? Is it maybe 60? I have seen cats that have 60% body fat. So, and that's where I really like uh, the morphometric measurements to kind of fine tune that a little bit more because I'm not good at estimating the percentage of body fat. So ALMA is definitely also in that, in that category. Um, if we look at the calculations for our patients, so we did morphometric measurements in these patients, which led, which led to 50% body fat based on the, what was found through the healthy weight protocol, um, which means if the dog has 50% body fat, 50% of the body is lean tissue, bone, muscle, and organs. So what we first do is calculate the lean body weight. So you just take 50% of the 44 kilogram, this dog has a lean body weight of 22 kilograms. Now, as I mentioned before, a dog that has a lean body condition score, five out of nine, has 20% fat. So you have to make sure that you don't do your calculations with this because this will be too low. This dog wouldn't have any fat at all anymore. Of course, we want, don't want that either. So you have to make sure that you add that's 20% fat, so that's why I divide by 0.8 to come up with the ideal uh, body weight of this dog, which is 27.5, which was also similar to what the owner uh, thought would be good for the dog, that he was weighing at 1.5 years of age. Another problem that we often see is how do we convince the owner that this dog was really being fed too much? Um, and that is where you can really use your diet history. And based on the diet history, we try to collect as much detail as possible so that we are able to calculate the daily energy intake and compare that with the daily energy requirement. So this is Alma's diet history. Alma is receiving a pet store bought light food. Um, this was actually a case that I have seen in Belgium. So the diet that this dog was on doesn't exist here, so it didn't really make any sense to put the name on it, of it on there. So the dog is receiving uh, 350 gram of this food, and aside from that, um, what was actually very interesting for this patient, and I, mean, I see many patients, many owners like that, they go and read the back, and she's like, well, my dog doesn't eat what the bag says for 45 kilograms. One of the things that we have to teach our clients is really, you don't have to read for the, on, if you're looking at, the amount of food being fed on, that is stated in the feeding guidelines on the food package, don't read for current weight, you have to read the table for ideal body weight because otherwise you're overfeeding. If your animal is already overweight, you just stimulate the overweightness and many clients don't know that. 
So she thought that the dog wasn't eating enough because he wasn't eating what the bag set for 45 kilograms. And the dog receives daily table scraps, cheese, chicken breast, and unfortunately also chocolate. Um, and uh, he also receives a jumbone once per week. So one jumbone actually contains 619 kcal. So if we look at this dog's energy intake, I just did the calculations for you. Um, in total, this dog actually receives like the food and I did, could not account for the table scraps because that varies too much, but the food, the cheese, the meat and the chocolate, 1,854 kcal per day. And then of course, if he would have that jumbo, that's another 619 kcal in addition to that. Is this dog receiving too much? So let's take a look at this dog's energy requirements. Um, when I want to compare with an energy requirement, I want to go with the ideal situation. How much does this dog have to eat when he would be lean and stay lean? So I will go with neutered adult to do my calculations in this case. Uh, this is not to treat the obesity, this is just to check how does it come that this dog is obese. Um, so ideal body weight, 27.5 kilograms is only 1,344 kcal per day. So do you remember? 1,854 kcal is what he is receiving without the jumbo. So this dog was definitely receiving too much. So for our clients, it often helps during our conversations if we actually, we receive our diet history forms in advance, so we can already do calculations in advance. And it's actually making it a little bit easier to have that conversation about are you really feeding too much? Well, yes, I've done the calculations. So the next thing is, of course, while well, we know the amount of too much, but what about the diet itself? Is the diet appropriate for weight loss? It is a light food. Who would continue with this, with this light food? All of you would discontinue the light food and switch to something else? Or do you just have a lot of doubts about it? Yeah? Yeah. And I, I just don't see the rationale for that because then by default you've increased the proportion of carbohydrates in your diet. Yeah. And when you've done that, especially in an older dog, but not all yeah, but not all carbohydrates are bad because if you say carbohydrates, you're including sugars, you're including starches, but also the fiber. And fiber, as I will continue in the presentation, is something that you would actually want in this patient because you want to stimulate satiety. So carbohydrates is like a too vague of a, of a term, but I know... Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a look at what we do when it comes to diet. So energy restriction is the utmost important thing. If you don't do energy restriction, those patients will not lose any weight at all. So it is important to bring them in a negative energy balance. But of course, if you do that, you're giving a smaller volume of food and you still want to make sure that the patient is not hungry, is not nagging, begging for food all the time. Um, so you want to make sure that you stimulate satiety as much as possible. On the other hand, you have to make sure that even with that smaller portion of food, that you're still providing all the nutrients that are essential for the patients in the right amounts. And then the last thing is, of course, nutraceuticals. There's tons of different nutraceuticals. I will just give you a list with a few, but there's so many reasons and so many different nutraceuticals, and they come on the market with new nutraceuticals every day. Uh, so it's really kind of an unending story there when it comes to nutraceuticals. So when we're talking about energy, there's really two aspects to energy. One is energy requirement, how much does the patient need? And the other aspect is how much should be in the food, so the energy density of the food. So when we're talking about energy requirement, um, when we're doing our calculations for weight loss, we will be using resting energy requirement for dogs. So we're using just a factor of one to multiply with. But for cats, we will use resting energy requirements times 0.8. I used to use resting energy requirements in cats as well, as many of my nutritionist colleagues did. 
But we noticed that usually after about a month time, you notice that this cat isn't losing weight at all. Let's drop that amount of food even a little bit lower. So that's why the new regulations or the new guidelines uh, like AHA has come up with um, weight management guidelines, uh, also the small animal clinical nutrition, they all the newer publications talk about 0.8 times RER for cats. And one of the reasons is cats are very difficult at losing weight and mostly because they're just not as active as dogs. Like with dogs, you can just go for walks and cats, it is much more difficult to stimulate that um, energy use. So for, I use this formula for resting energy requirements, so 70 times uh, body weight to the power 0.75. There's also another formula, which may be easier, uh, which is uh, 30 times body weight plus 70. Um, I prefer this one because it's more accurate. It actually accounts for the difference in um, body surface. So if you would have a Chihuahua versus a Great Dane, this formula is much more accurate than the other one. Um, so we will be using ideal body weight and keep in mind it's always a starting point. So every patient is different and you will have to adjust over time. It could be that a patient is not losing weight quickly enough. It could be that the patient is losing weight too quickly and you just kind of have to play with the amount of food. Then on the other hand, because we are doing this energy restriction, you still want to provide a big volume of food because that's what the client likes and that's what the dog likes or the cat likes. That's why we will be reducing fat, because fat is providing a lot of energy. The fat is actually uh, providing two per gram fat, you will generate two times more calories compared to one gram protein and one gram car carbohydrates. So if you want to make the food less energy dense, decreasing the fat. So a weight loss diet, most weight loss diets are typically 10% on a dry matter basis or lower. Um, fiber, fiber doesn't, um, and that's part of the healthy carbohydrates that I like to talk about. Um, fiber does not provide any, or not a lot of energy. So it's undigestible and it just provides bulk and it really helps to bulk up that food and increase the volume while not adding extra energy. So that's why those diets are higher in fiber. Water will also help to increase the energy, the, to decrease the energy density. Um, so that's why canned foods are often preferred to dry foods. Um, and then air. This has nothing to do with the patient at all, but it may be helpful for some of the owners. Uh, because some pet owners, if you're using like a kibble with a hole in the middle, or if you're using kibbles that are puffed, a um, little bit like Cheetos, um, those kibbles kind of seem larger and the volume seems bigger, which can help some owners kind of getting the impression that they're feeding a bigger volume of foods, but it doesn't have anything to do with satiety or anything. Um, so with fiber, of course, fiber stimulates satiety. Um, you have two types of fibers, soluble fiber, which means that they're water soluble or insoluble fiber. Now, both of them can really help with satiety. The insoluble fiber really increase the bulk along the GI tract. One of the things they also increase is the fecal bulk. Uh, so in the past, many of the weight loss diets were actually very high in insoluble fibers. And I remember, for instance, the Hills RD, when it first came on the market, it was a very bulky food. And there was a lot of complaints about the fecal production that was related with that diet. So since then, many of the companies changed their formulas and don't just include insoluble fiber, but also include soluble fiber, we ha which doesn't have as much of an effect on the fecal output um, and less clients complaining about that. Um, so most of them are using, using a mixture of fibers. Um, typically we're aiming at like 15 to 20 percent on a dry matter basis, but that's really when I'm talking about total dietary fiber. Um, the reason I really stress total dietary fiber is because if we're looking at um, pet food packages or uh, product guides, pet food companies usually mention crude fiber. And crude fiber, and that is probably because, of course, we animal, it was, pet food production was closely related to animal feed, and so for production animals, they, oh, sorry, uh, they use crude fiber, and that kind of 
when rolled over into the pet food industry as well. So crude fiber is what you find on a, on a label. Yet the crude fiber only includes cellulose, lignin, and a little bit of the hemicellulosis, which really means insoluble fiber, and you're losing all the soluble fibers. Uh, this, where do the soluble fibers end up? Well, you already mentioned carbohydrates and nitrogen-free extracts. The nit nitrogen-free extract is something that you can, um, they don't analyze for it, you get it just by calculation. Um, so it's just kind of the leftovers after the analysis of all the other components in the diet. So the monounisaccharides, the, the starches, but also the soluble fibers are part of that nitrogen-free extract. So if we're saying, well, a high carbohydrate food, everybody is usually referring to high in nitrogen free extract, but part of what we want is also part of that nitrogen free extract. It would be better if pet food industry would decide to go with total dietary fiber, which just gives you the soluble plus the insoluble fiber and is a, what is typically used um, on human food products. So it would, be, it would make much more sense. You see that there's a little difference here between crude fiber and total dietary fiber, which is the lignin. Lignin is not used in pet food at all, so it wouldn't really matter um, if that wouldn't be there anymore. So I, I don't know when that change will happen. Um, usually it's AFCO that, that makes that kind of changes, and that is something that can take decades. Um, so for now, you, what you can do is check the ingredient list to see if there's actually soluble fiber added to the diet. You can check for uh, fructooligosaccharides, inulin, guar gum, locust bean gum, uh, beet pulp has a combination of both. Uh, so there's definitely those things that you can do. Otherwise, contact the company and ask for TDF. I know Hills has TDFs for all their diets, um, so no problem contacting Hills. Also, Purina and Royal Canin are able to give you that information. Um, yeah. So other ways to increase satiety, increase the number of meals. Um, four meals a day is typically what we recommend. Three meals is what everybody can do. Like you give a meal in the morning, you give one when you come home at night from work, and one before bed. If you're at home at lunchtime, you can do four meals. So three to four meals is what we usually recommend. If the people are able to give more meals, that's even better. Um, protein, uh, in humans and in rodents, protein has been linked with increasing satiety. So in cats and dogs, we also typically want somewhat higher protein diets, um, not only because of satiety, but also because it helps conserving lean body mass as well. Um, and then uh, water and satiety. So again, some people prefer to go with wet foods um, in, to treat obesity. There is at this point in time no actual proof that giving a canned food or giving a dry food with added water actually stimulates satiety more than a dry food. Um, there's a couple of research groups that are working on that, but up so, so far I haven't heard any confirmation um, about that. In cats, it could help in a way because cats are volume eaters. If they are used to eat a small portion of dry food, if you offer them a canned food the first day, they may not be able to eat the full amount. So there it may help you a little bit, but in the end, after a couple of days, weeks, they will be completely adjusted to it. Um, I, for me, the choice between dry and canned has more to do with what is convenient for the client and then the dog or the cat itself. Like if there would be health issues like urolits or anything, definitely canned. Um, but if, um, if you have a cat that doesn't like the texture of canned food and would, that would stop eating while the cat is obese, I don't want to evoke hepatic lipidosis either. Then I'd rather have the cat on dry food if she's used to that. So the utmost important thing is that the diet has to be complete and balanced. And as I mentioned, with that energy restriction, you're, making, you're giving the animal a smaller volume of food, so you still have to make sure that all the nutrients are in there. So if you would go with a diet that is not designed for obesity and you're restricting um, an energy and therefore the volume of food becomes smaller, that animal would be at risk for deficiencies in protein, essential fatty acids, essential amino acid vitamins and minerals. So that's why we really say veterinary diets only for 
uh, treating weight loss because those diets are enhanced in those essential nutrients. So even if you feed them at a smaller volume, there's still enough of it in it, uh, while that is not the case with over-the-counter light foods. Um, of course, it really depends on the patient again. If you have a patient that is only a little bit overweight, uh, you could still go with uh, an over-the-counter diet, but only when you, you can only restrict for 10% and not for 40% as why, what I'm recommending here. Um, and it's only like when you would have a patient that is a six out of nine. If you have a patient that is a nine out of nine, never try an over-the-counter diet because he has to lose too much weight and the weight loss plan will take too long time. To, the patient would be too much at risk for deficiencies over that long time. So just to give you an idea about the diets that are out there over the counter, um, light foods, low calorie foods. So AFCO sets um, guidelines. I cannot say requirements because technically AFCO is not law. So uh, guidelines for cat foods and dog foods. So the light really refers to the calories. So the numbers that you see here for the calories is the maximum of KCAL that can be in that food. Um, then for the low fat, they really refer to only the fat. So um, there's, that's the only thing that they, uh, they really look at. The company doesn't have to do anything else with the other nutrients. So it says, well, that diet is lower in calories or it's lower in fat, uh, but it doesn't say anything about being enhanced in other nutrients to make sure that if you restrict, the diet is still complete and balanced. So is the current diet appropriate? Well, even without looking at the nutrient profile, I already know that this is not appropriate just because the diet is an over-the-counter diet and it's not designed for weight loss at all. So for ALMA, well, maybe first, last slide to, before I go to, to diets for ALMA, is nutraceuticals. Um, there's a long list and I added these three dots at the bottom because really this list becomes longer and longer. Um, nutraceuticals can help with a lot of things in obesity. Um, L-carnitine, you probably all heard about L-carnitine, helps with stimulating fat metabolism. It helps shuttling um, the fatty acids into the mitochondria and stimulates fatty acid oxidation. Um, fish oil helps with managing the inflammation that Moran already talked about uh, today. Um, antioxidants, oxidative stress is a big problem in patients that are obese, so antioxidants actually help counteract that oxidative stress. Um, Fructooligosaccharides is an example of a soluble fiber that is actually, one, helpful to stimulate satiety, but also help, helpful in managing the glucose response because insulin resistance is indeed one of the problems that we see in obese animals. Um, many of those dogs and cats have joint problems, so glucosamine, chondroitine sulfate are also often added to those diets to help with cartilage repair. Now, before going back to Alma, I really talked a lot about low-fat, high-fiber weight loss diets, which is really the classical approach to weight loss. Yet there are two alternatives to that as well that have been a little bit more new. Um, the Katkins diet. Uh, this is the diet that is really used for diabetes management in cats. The reason I say Katkins diet is because the nutrient profile really resembles a lot to the Atkins diets that are available for humans for, for weight loss. So these diets are well, it's very important, very low on the carbohydrate side, and really specifically it's the starches and the simple, well there's no simple sugars in any of the diabetes foods that are out there, uh, but the starches are really reduced. There can still be soluble fiber in it. Um, high protein, moderate fat, um, and a low to moderate uh, fiber level. Now, when we're talking about weight loss, it is really only the Hills MD that has a weight loss claim. Um, the Purina DM is also a Katkins diet, does not have a weight loss claim, and also the Royal Canin Diabetic does not have a weight loss claim. Now, it's only the Hills one. Uh, now, what is behind this, this idea is really when you are feeding so you see dietary proteins come in here, carbohydrates and fats. 
and they all lead to energy. If you bring in the, a lot of carbohydrates, there will be a lot of surplus carbohydrates and glucose that have to be shuttled somewhere. So instead of the animal cannot use everything for energy, so part of that, if it's in excess, it will be shuttled towards fat storage. If you are actually reducing the dietary carbohydrates in the food, you don't have that surplus anymore because the animal, especially in the cats, because they are such a gluconeogenic animals, they really use their amino acids coming from dietary protein to produce glucose themselves to serve their essential glucose pool um, without having that excess, of carbo of that excess of glucose within the body. So that means that for energy, they actually have to use their fats for energy. So they switch more to fat metabolism once that you start restricting them. And they will also use ketone bodies. Um, I think it's theoretically a good approach. Yeah, what I like less about this type of diets is that the fat content can be quite high and because of the fiber level quite low and because of that, the, food, the energy density of the food becomes also much higher and the volume of food becomes much smaller, which means that I'm not sure if your cat will be completely sat satiated. The cat may be hungry, may be begging all the time and the owner may not be happy. And then there's, of course, the question about compliance again. So that for me, that is a reason why I still in cats prefer, I will use those diets for diabetes for sure. But for weight loss, I tend to go with a high fiber, low fat diet. And then the other approach, um, other alternative that we currently have is, of course, uh, as an example, the Hills Metabolic. Um, the idea behind this diet is completely different than everything I just spoke about because I really focused on key nutritional factors and if I apply my key nutritional factor rules to this diet, it doesn't make any sense at all anymore. Uh, so I would never select this diet based on key nutritional factors, yet the idea is completely different. So what Hills has done is at first they looked at, they took fat tissue samples from healthy lean animals and from obese animals. And they did uh, what they call a uh, microarray, looked at the gene expression of thousand genes at the same times, and they compared lean with obese. And they just looked at, well, which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off. And they've noticed that there was like, if you look at this uh, figure here, every row is a gene and every column is a dog. So you have the lean dogs, here on your, on your left, and you have on your right the, the obese dogs. So you can actually see that there's for some of, the, for these genes that are reported here, that there is really a big difference, that some of the genes, like the red means that they are switched on, so upregulated with obesity, but downregulated in the lean, and these are upregulated in the lean, but downregulated in the obese. So at Hills, the researchers were thinking, well, is there a way that we can turn that situation back? Can we switch those genes off that are switched on and the other way around? So then they came up with a magical blend of nutrients and don't ask me what is in it. It's all patented and I don't have any idea. I just find this figure on the Hills website that kind of can give you a little bit of an idea of things that they have put in there. L-carnitine for sure. I see coconut, so I'm thinking coconut oil, maybe linseed oil, um, tomato pomace, carrot pomace, and there will for sure be other things in there as well. But they came up with this magical blend of nutrients that they first tested in vitro. And indeed, they were able to switch that situation back with their blend of nutrients and nutraceuticals. So that's when that blend worked in vitro, they were like, well, let's create a pet food um, and tested pet, this pet food in the real life. So they've done a weight loss study in both cats and dogs. So this figure is showing you um, the cat figure. Um, th these were the obese cats. So you, you see the red is turned on, the blue is turned off um, before the start of the weight loss study. And then at the end of the weight loss study, you see that uh, complete, those genes completely switched. After when they reached their ideal body weight, they actually kept the cats on the same food. And they, for, I, I don't remember by head for, for how long it was, uh, but they kept the cats on the same food Six months, thank you. Um, so you actually see that even after six months, those genes did not turn back to what they were when they were obese. 
Um, also, the amount of food that those cats could eat was very high. So usually, we're afraid and giving them go switching back to maintenance food because we are afraid that they would start gaining their weight again. But with, apparently, with the Hills Metabolics, though, cats, cats could actually continue to eat large amount of foods without gaining a gram and with their genes uh, that were still, uh, still reversed, let's say, like that. Um, so it is sometimes a little bit difficult to, to grasp the idea, and I think especially if you have to explain that with a client, um, it, is, it is a little bit different, but I think nutrigenomics is really a fascinating world of science. Um, just to summarize, like these are actually the Hills uh, feline weight management foods, just to show you how different the, the nutrients are in these diets. Um, I talked about low fat, high fiber diet, like the Hills RD is definitely a low fat, high fiber diet, and it's the TDF, that is, the total dietary fiber that is reported here. The MD for cats is high protein, low carb, but also much higher in fat and lower in fiber. And then the metabolic, if you look at the nutrients, it actually fits right in the middle uh, between the others. So it doesn't really make any sense at all. Now, in the end, I think when it comes to obesity, the energy restriction is the most important thing. No matter which diet you use, as long as you're restricting enough in energy, the patient should lose the weight. Of course, there will be differences in how much fat versus how much muscle tissue will, will the animal lose. Uh, but energy restriction is really key. So um, how much to feed? Determine ideal body weight. Calculate the energy requirements, RER, RER point, point, times 0.8 in cats. Um, look for the energy density in the product guide. Um, AFCO has actually made uh, a new guideline that energy density should be mentioned on the label or on the package, so not only for veterinary diets, but also for pet store diets. Yet it will take a couple of years before we actually get there because, you know, pet food companies already have a lot of packaging in stock. So they will have to go through that stock first before they can actually make new bags that actually have the energy density. Um, and then calculate the food dose, which is energy requirement divided by energy density. Now, you can calculate the amount of food per cups. Yet make sure that your client knows which cup to use because we see people coming in with the strangest cup sizes, uh, going from some kind of icing cup that they got with some kind of donut to a very, very big cup. Um, so, and even if they are using the eight ounces cup, there's actually 20% variation in calories per cup. Um, so every time they scoop, there can be 20% difference in calories. Uh, also, if you would ask different people to fill up the cup, one person will really add too much in it and another person won't. So I really don't, especially when it comes to weight loss, um, I really don't like this kind of approach. And we teach our uh, clients that come to our OVC clinical nutrition service to use gram scale. So they all go home with the tips how to use gram scale handouts. Um, it's much more accurate and it's also much easier for you to make adjustments. Like if the cat is not losing any weight, will you send the client home and say, well, from tomorrow on, just give one sixteenth of a cup less than what you give today. And you know this isn't going to work at all. Uh, so gram scales, is re it's really easier. Like your cat has 50, 850 gram, doesn't lose weight, well, I'll go with 45 gram. It's much easier. Uh, the funny thing, though, is that when we are talking about gram scales, I now had two clients like that, that um, actually... They said, oh yeah, we know a gram scale. I, you, we use it for baking all the time. You don't have to explain me. Um, and then all of a sudden they start thinking and they're like, yeah, but how, how should I weigh the food without the bowl? So I actually have to explain them that there's a tar button and apparently both clients were using like plastic foil or styrofoam paper to put on the scale before they started weighing the food because they didn't want to weigh the bowl with the food but you can put the ball on the scale, press the tar button so that the scale goes to zero and then add the food. So it's sometimes funny how our conversations often, often go, um, but it's really, I'm, I'm European myself. I'm completely used to this and I use a gram scale in my kitchen every day, uh, but it's, it's for some people here quite an eye opener to start using, using this. But once they are 
using the gram scale, once they're used to it, it's much easier to communicate with them about uh, the actual food that their dog or cat is eating. So once you calculated any amount of food, especially in cats, my rule is no free food. I only offer food through food toys, um, food puzzles. My cat at home is, eat this is not my cat, but it's similar. I should actually add a picture of my own cat there. My cat is eating from an egg carton box at home. If she receives her food bowl, like a regular food bowl, she just eats everything all at once. With the egg carton box, she just goes through it much slow slower. She actually has to play with her paws to get the kibble out of it. Um, and she is a little bit more active that way. She's less bored. She, she has something to do. Um, she slowed down when it comes to eating behavior. So that is really helpful. And it doesn't have, for me, it doesn't have to be expensive food toys. You can easily, there's tons of YouTube videos on how to make this kind of food puzzles for, for cats and dogs. Um, the Kong is a really good thing, except if you do it the way it is done here, um, adding treats and peanut butter in the Kong is not an ideal way of when you want to achieve weight loss or when you want your dog to maintain a healthy body weight. Uh, so we do recommend using a Kong, but we, I, if the cat or the dog is on, dry on canned food, you can fill it with the canned food itself, or you could use uh, like uh, vegetable or fruit purees or things like that. Definitely not peanut butter. It's too high in fat and too high in salt. So treats and snacks, I'm very strict. So preferably, I always try to push the clients in the direction of not to use any treats, especially in the beginning of the weight loss plan, uh, because I want to see if the diet plan is really working. Yet I find that I have to do a lot of compromises as well. So but this is my first approach, but usually I'd have to add uh, treats anyway. If you have to compromise with the owner and add treats, make sure to, cho to choose low carol calorie, low fat treats. And there's many veterinary brands treats available. Um, like Hills has some treats. Um, Purina has the uh, light snackers. Uh, Royal Canin has the Medi treats. Like I was just looking at a package of Medi treats for cats. Like it's only 1.5 kcal per treat, uh, which is extremely low in, in calories and much better than many of the treats that, are, uh, that you can find in the pet stores. Even uh, greenies, uh, if you want to give a dental treat, the greenies treats, uh, they have a weight management one, uh, and it's divided into different categories among, uh, according to the size of the dogs. So you could always give the small breed dog to a bigger, bigger dog if you want lower calories. Um, the good thing about the greenies, greenie treats for any kind of patient that you have, it's the only treat on the market that actually has an AFCO nutritional adequacy statement for adult maintenance. So it's still a diet, it's still actually complete and balanced for maintenance. Um, if you, you can also add fruits and vegetables. So just a couple of examples of things that I often use are baby carrots. Uh, cherry tomatoes, apple slices, so like one cherry tomato is only one kcal. So you can give to a dog like Alma, you can really give quite a lot of cherry tomatoes. Um, so account for those treats in the diet plan, do your calculations and make sure that you account for the treats. Um, and treats can only be, as Moran already mentioned, uh, when we were talking about patient assessment, can only be 10% of the daily calories. You cannot go over that because otherwise your complete unbalanced diet will not complete, be complete unbalanced anymore. Um, I also like to stress once more that definitely if you have clients coming in that want to give treats, raw, raw meat-based treats or freeze-dried treats are definitely something that we don't recommend. One, they're, especially in overweight animals, they're excess calories, uh, they're quite caloric. Bacterial contamination, and many people, we all know about the raw diets, but really if you look at the freeze-dried treats, like things like rawhide, uh, bully sticks, uh, freeze-dried liver treats, all those belong to that same category and are as contaminated as the raw meat-based uh, diets. Also with liver treats, uh, that can actually cause vitamin A toxicosis because the liver is really a storage organ of vitamin A. So I prefer not to, to use those at all. So the goal of weight loss is really that it has to be safe weight loss. 
0.5 to 2% of the initial body weight per week, on average about 1% of the body weight. Um, the reason why I want to achieve weight loss slowly is because I want to conserve, conserve lean body mass. Um, other ways to help with that is more protein in the diet, as I mentioned already, and Dr. Jersey will talk about exercise uh, a little bit later on. Also, yo-yo effect is something that we see in animals the same way as we see it in humans. So if the weight loss goes too quickly, weight comes back very quickly too. Um, and then the last reason it has to go slow, especially in cats, is to prevent hepatic lipidosis. Um, we really want a gradual diet transition in those cats, make sure that they continue to eat, um, that they don't stop eating at all. Also make sure, and that's where the gram scale comes in handy, make sure that the client doesn't only weigh how much they're feeding, but also how much the cat has actually eaten, so that you can keep track of the food intake, and if the food intake is too low, that the client can contact your practice. Um, and usually I recommend bi-weekly weigh-ins, but if you have those very fat cats that are really finicky eaters, I would ask them to come in every week to at least body weight, body condition score, muscle condition score, check, a bit, check their food intake, make sure that you're there in time if that cat would develop hepatic lipidosis. Now, 2% of the weight loss, like 2% of the initial body weight per week is the absolute maximum for cats. A cat cannot um, lose any more weight per week or she is at risk to develop uh, hepatic lipidosis. Okay, so back to Alma. Um, the goal for Alma is to lose 27, no, is to lose weight up until 27.5 kilogram. We already mentioned that we're not gonna continue with the current diet. We want to go with something uh, that is a veterinary diet designed for weight loss. So I have listed weight loss diets here. I did forget to mention the Hills Metabolic on that slide. So all the diets on the slide are really low fat, high fiber diets. Um, there is a little bit of difference though. Um, one that I would like to point out is the IAMS uh, weight loss. As you can see, the fat content is much higher than the, the, uh, the other diets. Also, the fiber is much lower. Now, one of the things is, I know this is insoluble fiber, of course. I don't know the total dietary fiber for the IAMS diets. I contacted IAMS and they said they don't do those analysis on their foods. Um, so, NA is not analyzed. Um, I do have the ones for Royal Canin, but I forgot to add them on here. Um, so they are similar, like the satiety support would be very similar to the Purina and the RD. The calorie control is lower in fiber than the other diets. So if you have a dog that is really begging for food a lot, really the Hills RD, the Purina OM or the Royal Canin satiety support are really the highest in fiber. Um, so once we decided what kind of diet to give, we will do the calculations for ALMA. We will go with one time RER for ideal body weight is about 840 kcals per day. Um, in this case, we've chosen the Hills RD dry. Um, so she, he, she, I don't, even, don't know anymore, she um, receives like 255 gram per day, which is only 90% of the calories. So as you can see, I'm not giving her full energy requirements. I'm just giving 90% of that because these clients wanted treats as well, so I added 10% as treats. So I really made that calculation to make sure that even with the treats added to the diet plan, that this dog would not receive any more calories than we wanted her to have for weight loss. Um, and we also went with four meals. So what we also always calculate is the minimum and maximum weight loss so that a client has an idea uh, about that. If like whenever the weight loss goes too quickly or uh, whenever the weight loss goes too small, slowly, we can make adjustments to that. Uh, so we did those calculations as well. Minimum is 0.5% of the initial weight and a maximum is 2%. Um, another calculation that we like doing to, um, for clients is also how long will the weight loss plan take? Because many clients think that weight loss will go quickly and that in two months all will be 27.5 kilograms, which is really not the case. Um, so we go with an average of 1% weight loss per week and then it should take about 
1.5 weeks, uh, which is, yeah, eight months, about, about eight months, uh, eight to nine months. Um, so seven to eight, yes. Um, so really weight loss is really taking a lot of time and it is important that clients know that at the beginning because often they become disencouraged because they don't see the results quickly. So if you're honest about that at the beginning that it will be a long process, it's often better for owner compliance. Okay, any questions so far? No, I have two more cases um, because Alma was really a patient where it was straightforward treating weight loss. Uh, while we may have, you may see much more difficult cases when the animal is obese, but at the same time, there's other diseases that, that come in and that may be a little bit more challenging. So this cat, Billy, is actually a cat that presented being overweight. So a 6.2 kilogram, body condition nine out of nine, um, had a 45% body fat after morphometric measurements. Um, and then looking at blood work, urinalysis, the cat was actually diagnosed with, um, with diabetes type 2 and obesity. So what would you do in this, in this case? When you have this kind of cat that comes in, is diabetic, is also overweight, what kind of diet would you choose in those patients? Would you go with a diabetes, diet designed for diabetes? Would you go with one designed for weight loss? What kind of energy requirement would you use? Anyone with any suggestions? Hmm? The MD? Yeah. So I actually compiled a list of all the diets that are available that can be used for diabetic animals. So this list gives you um, dry foods for cats with diabetes. And I just see, I should have added the RAIN Clinical Nutrition one as well. I forgot that one. Uh, but it's a diabetes food, it's not a weight loss diet. So everything below the black line is designed for diabetes, but not for weight loss. So if you want to achieve both at the same, you, you want to manage the diabetes, but at the same time uh, manage the obesity as well, you have to go, as I mentioned before, with a diet that is actually designed for weight loss, because otherwise, even if it is a veterinary diet, it is, those diets are not designed to be fed at a smaller volume and to restrict so much in energy. So these diets below the black line are definitely okay for diabetic cats, but not when you want to treat the obesity. If you want to treat the obesity, you have to go with everything that is above the black line. And those are actually um, designed for weight loss. The ones that are in black are the classical diets. Uh, so those are high fiber, low fat diets. The ones in red are the Katkins diets. So the MD is the only one that is actually a Katkins diet and at the same time designed for weight loss. Yet as I mentioned before, I'm a bit afraid, even if that cat would have diabetes, I'm a bit afraid of going with that diet uh, because of the high energy density, higher in fat, lower in fiber. And it could be that your cat is begging all the time and is feeling very hungry. Um, it really depends on the patients. Um, some cats do very well on it and it's definitely an option that we have out there. But for other cats where uh, they may be begging more um, and maybe nagging for food all the time, uh, in those cases I would prefer to go with something that is lower in energy density and higher in fiber. Um, so then definitely all the other weight loss diets are also okay for those cats um, because like for that management of diabetes, we still have the two options available. We have the Katkins diets available, but also the fiber diets is still an option. We used to talk only about fiber diets in the past, but we still have both options available. And it's not since the existence of the Katkins diet that we're not thinking about the other option anymore. It really depends on the patient. Yeah. That, that is very difficult to answer because insulin resistance really depends on so many things. So there's the carbohydrate, the amount of carbohydrates in the food, and then there's the different types of carbohydrates. So you have the simple sugars versus the complex starches versus the soluble fiber. If you look at a simple sugar, you will have a spike in glucose in the blood immediately because there's no digestion that is needed in that case. You just get an absorption of glucose immediately. The simple, the complex starches, need to be digested first, so that will take a little bit longer uh, before those uh, are digested. You will not have such a high spike, but you will still have 
a more gradual high, high peak with a soluble fiber and the insoluble fiber, you will have something that is really very gradual, uh, much more slow. But then it's also within the fibers, there's also different types and every type will have a different, um, a different insulin and glucose profile. Um, so that is one thing. If you then look at the different carbohydrate sources, like rice is definitely something that we don't want in our diabetic diets. Um, typically, guar no, um, I'm thinking, um, it's not guar gum. Maybe it'll come back later. There's one specific uh, one specific uh, carbohydrate, that it, so if you look at different carbohydrate sources, there's definitely differences between the different carbohydrate sources. One will have a much quicker insulin response than another. Um, protein also has an effect on it, especially in cats, amino acid stimulates the pancreas very much, especially arginine, stimulates insulin secretion very much. Um, and then of course, if you bring all of that together in a complex pet food matrix, it really is an all different story again, because you can look at every single carbohydrate source, and there, there's a lot of studies that have happened like that, where you just look one specific carbohydrate source, but it's not part of the whole diet. But then you bring all of that together in a diet, and all these different nutrients interact together, and it becomes much more complicated. So these different diets, I cannot really say which one will be the best because they've never been compared to each other. Uh, theoretically, all of, those diet, all of those companies have kind of tried to select to eliminate simple sugars, eliminate rice, make sure that they uh, select the um, carbohydrate sources that are less, um, less harmful. Barley would be one of the uh, carbohydrates that is um, more uh, better in, when it comes to insulin resistance and, and um, glucose tolerance. Now, um, aside from that, like it's, it, is, it is a very difficult area and there's still a lot of things that we, that we don't know about it, especially if you focus on specifically on cats. Um, a lot of the studies that were done were actually done with feeding the cats one big meal in the morning and then do their glucose and insulin measures after that, but a cat doesn't eat that way. It's not really the natural way a cat behaves. Eating a big meal is more a dog thing than a, than a cat thing. So there, uh, I think her name is Margrethe Hoenig. She is a, um, a professor and a researcher who is doing a lot of research, carbohydrates and cats. And she's now doing studies where she's actually not just giving one big meal, but she let the, lets the cat room throughout the day and just eat whenever they like, free, just, as a cat would eat like 10 to 20 small meals per day as they would do in the wild. Um, and they have these little glucose meters on that I was measuring their glucose constantly. So I think that kind of research will help us better to understand what we currently have, but it's a very, very difficult area where it's difficult to, as you can see, it's very difficult to give an answer to that, to that question. Um, also, when it comes to Katkin's diet versus high fiber diet, uh, the studies that were done were um, really done with a very small group of animals. Um, and they were also comparing diets that were very different. Um, so if we look at the study that was done with the Hills MD, they used the WD as the counterpart. Um, Okay, you can say maybe this diet is working better than the other, but you cannot say the conclusions that were drawn for, from that is that a low carb, high protein diet is better. Uh, but also the fiber level was different, the fiber sources were different, the protein sources were different, the carb sources were different. There were so many differences there that it's really difficult to draw conclusions from that research. And that is why there's still no ACVIM consensus on carbohydrates because the consensus panel simply doesn't agree either. And I think it will take a couple of more years of research before we can actually agree upon that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I should have warned you. <laughs> I should have said at the beginning that I did my PhD on carbohydrate metabolism in cats. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I, simple answer, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so, but for weight loss, everything above the black line is definitely what you can use. Also for the canned foods, again, everything above the, the black line 
uh, is okay for weight loss of a diabetic cat. And you can continue that diet even uh, when the cat is back at an ideal body weight as well, if you don't want to change the diet too many times in the diabetic cat. Um, maybe one thing to point about, since we were talking about diabetic, diabetic diets, since there was a little bit more interest, this, um, I just want to show you, as you can see, the Royal Canin diabetic is, the dry food is more of a, a high fiber, uh, low fat, lower fat, well, it's not a weight loss diet, so I cannot really talk about the fat and diabetes, but a more of fiber diet. So it really like, has like 7.8% fiber. The carbohydrates are like 27. Well, if you look at the canned foods, the carbohydrates are much lower. The fiber is still a little bit the same, but as you can see, the, fiber, the carbohydrates in the canned food is much lower than in the dry foods. So the canned food is a Katkins diet, the dry food is not a Katkins diet. So if you would mix the two together, you're kind of mixing two different approaches to diabetes in cats. Okay, so if you wanna have that cat to lose weight, energy requirement that you will use is 0.8 times RER in cats. Um, so when you can go with, I didn't do the calculations for this one, but you can go with any diet that was above that but long, line as long as it has a claim for weight loss and it could be that one cat is doing well with the Hills MD for instance, but if you have a cat that is begging and nagging a lot, it may be worth trying the high fiber diets. And then the last one, and that kind of brings us uh, a little bit more closer to uh, Dr. Jersey's talk on, on exercise, uh, SEP was a Jack Russell Terrier that actually came in being a nine out of nine, 60% body fat, 14.3 uh, kilograms. Um, he actually had atopic dermatitis, uh, luckily no food allergy because that would make the situation even more complicated for us. Um, in that case, honestly, there's only a homemade diet that is possible. Um, but he had immune-mediated immune polyarthritis and was being treated with prednisone for that and gaining weight because of that. It's not the prednisone that they are gaining weight from. They just eat more because they are on prednisone. So part of that can be limited by the owner if they are really strict in feeding. But of course, if you have a dog at home that is begging all the time, it's very easy to just add extras to it. So for two, two years ago, the dog was on RD uh, for weight loss without any success, and then he was about 10 kilograms. So since then, he has really gained a lot of weight. They switched to the JD, Heels JD because of the joint problems. So the dog is still receiving 100 gram of JD per day, dry food. And they're also, with the medications, he's receiving two slices of bread with chicken breast. Um, I'm actually happy that there's just chicken breast between this, this dog sandwich. We had one dog a couple of weeks ago that was receiving an RD sandwich. So they were actually, we were asking, well, did the dog like the RD? We just gave them one can to try at home because it was such a finicky eater. Um, and yeah, 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 she lo he, he really likes the, the RD. Apparently the client gave it as what she calls an RD sandwich. Layer of bread, layer of RD, raw steak, and another layer of bread. But the dog really loved the RD. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, the dog hasn't lost any weight at all. We've been, that was one of our cases where we are not really successful with. So I have those two, to be honest. Um, so this dog is very hungry and steals a lot of food as well. So what I really wanted to bring up here is that, of course, JD is a magnificent diet when it comes to treating joint problems. But when the patient is... Um, overweight and you need to achieve weight loss, again, it is not designed for weight loss. So you really have to choose one of the weight loss diets uh, to make them lose weight. But then, of course, you don't have the benefits of that JD anymore. Now, the real benefit in the JD is in the fish oil. So we really looked at, for this patient, we looked at the different diets available and we checked, well, which one has a lot of fish oil in it. So we didn't have all the EPA and DHA concentrations for the diet. So we just looked at the ingredient list and checked 
fish oil yes, fish oil no. So it was only the, actually the satiety support that at that point in time, I don't know if it's still like that, uh, had the fish oil and had a fair um, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So anything below five, like five, out of, uh, five to one is what is typically recommended. Also, the amount of glucosamine and chondroitine sulfate was actually even higher uh, than what was in the, in the JD itself. Yeah, the JD is typically the, the fish oil that is so high and it's really having the clinical effect. So we decided to go with the satiety support. So satiety support for an ideal body weight of seven kilograms, um, one time RER, uh, which is 100 gram per day divided into four meals. Of course, we still don't have that full effect of the JD. So what we decided here is to calculate, we would con so he was on a glucosamine and chondroitine supplement. Um, so we actually advised the client to just continue with what they were doing there. Um, and then for the fish oil, we looked at, we contacted Hills and we checked, we asked them like how much EPA and DHA is in the food and we calculated that this dog was at that point with that 100 gram of JD receiving 743 milligram of EPA and DHA per day. If we calculate the same for Royal Canin, so the satiety support, so we contacted them as well and we had 300 milligrams. So you see that there's quite, quite a difference there. So what we did is we actually added a uh, fish oil supplement, a Santa uh, canine omega-3 to it to make up for that difference. Uh, so we added two milliliters, which brought it at about uh, like close to, uh, I think a little bit over, like almost 770 milligram per day. Um, can't you, some people will say, well, this is the dose of EPA and DHA that we took, these are the two doses that are kind of used. Uh, for that kind of uh, diseases. Now, can't you just throw that fish oil on top of that uh, satiety support without looking what is already inside? Well, you have to be a little bit cautious with that as well because we often forget about the adverse effects that fish oil can have, uh, especially in our obese animals. One, it's a fat source. So you're still adding extra fat to the diet. So if you know that that dose is what that the patient was good with that, why adding more? Because you're just adding extra fat, more energy, and a risk that he won't be losing the weight. Um, also, uh, it um, may stimulate oxidative stress. It may reduce immunity, and those are already problems of obese animals. Um, it may give you a problem with blood coagulation as well. So we see that um, people that are living in very northern areas that are eating only fish have blood coagulation problems. So we don't know to what extent this would occur in dogs and cats as well, but it's of course better to be safe there. And then wound healing. If you would have a patient that has some kind of orthopedic problem and has to go for surgery, you really have to keep in mind that adding a fish oil supplement can actually reduce immunity and at the same time delay wound healing. So not really something that we want for our surgery. Uh, patient. So that's why I really, I wanted Sub to have the supplement but he, because he really benefited from it, but I didn't want to give too much either. So we followed Sep over time and we, we checked him more regular than this, but these were kind of just to give you an idea. His weight loss really went very well. This was a client, kind of client that was really uh, cooperating with us very well. Actually at the beginning before we saw him when he had this terrible uh, immune mediated uh, polyarthritis, they were actually thinking of euthanizing the animal because they didn't know what, what they could do for him um, anymore. But then once they find the right prednisone dose and we could manage the obesity, this dog was actually, actually safe from euthanasia. Um, now what to do when that dog is on ideal body weight? Will you adjust the diet plan? And if you will adjust it, how would you adjust it? Would you switch to something else? Or would you continue with the weight loss plan, uh, with the weight loss diet? Anyone? What would you do? Everybody's unsure? What do you do with your patients now? Switching? All of you switch to something else? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, and definitely like weight loss diets, you can feed them long term as well. So it's no problem to continue them on a weight loss diet, but you will have to increase the amount. So what we typically do is we recalculate the amount of food for inactive obese prone instead of weight loss and that should stabilize their body weight. I really like continuing them on a weight loss diet or switching to um, a weight management diet like the Hills WD for instance, uh, which is it's still not hot, it's still moderate in fat. There's still a fair amount of fiber, so that could help maintaining their, their body weight. Switching them back to an actual maintenance food isn't really like there are patients that may tolerate it, but there's a lot of patients. And I would be worried again about satiety because you are still not feeding the full maintenance energy requirement here. Yeah. So in the end, um, but it's very when it comes to diet and, and your clients, it's really important uh, to take time. And I know your consults are often very short and you don't always have a lot of time with your clients. But it's really important that you explain why obesity is so important, what, why you think the pet is obese, why a specific diet you, you want to describe, why the reason is that you want to do that. Um, because it's really important that the client understands. If they don't understand, they probably won't be compliant with your diet plan, but also listen to the client. Um, make sure you understand the owner's needs and the dog and cat's needs. Um, as I mentioned, no use to prescribe a canned food to a cat, even if you think that a canned food is better for weight loss than a cat. No use to prescribe that if that cat has never in her life received any canned food at all, doesn't like the texture and will stop eating. So it's really important to listen uh, to the owner and, and to understand the dog's or the cat's needs, work with the client and compromise. But in the end, make sure that you're restricting in calories and that you're not giving too much calories. Yes, treats are okay, uh, but don't give too much of it. Overall, prevent obesity. Do your nutritional assessment in every pet every time and make sure that the number of patients that come to your practice are just not overweight and you will not have this problem to solve. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so with the same that we do with treats, we do that with fish oil as well. So no more than 10% of calories is what we do. Um, typically, you would have some supplements will come with a caloric statement, not all of them. Um, but then we typically calculate uh, like just using, um, I think it's nine times, Moran, is it nine times fats? I always have the kilo, I'm too European, I always have the kilojoules in my head instead of the kcals. So it's nine times the amount of fat in the supplement would be the kcal um, that you have in the, in the supplement. We just take that little part, so if you would calculate your, if you had a pet nutrition course long time ago, uh, you would have that um, calculation of metabolizable energy. So uh, four times carbs of four times protein plus nine times fat plus four times carbs. You just take the little fat parts out of it because there's no carbs and there's no protein in there. And the essential fish oil specifically contains about 94% um, fish oil itself and then the rest is, is water, I yeah. assume. So you can really use that. As yeah. So yeah, we do the same with those calories, definitely. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you started a list, compiling a list of how many, um, how much fish oil is in different diets. No, I have to contact the companies. Yeah. Uh, we, well, usually when I contact a company for one diet, I kind of write it down somewhere so that I find it for the next patient. Uh, but we still end up calling companies every, every single day uh, to get more information. The problem is those things change as well and change rather quickly. So I often have people asking me for comparison charts between different companies like all the GI diets or all the weight loss diets. It just changes constantly and it's, it's very difficult to keep up with it. Yeah. So would be good if that would exist. <laughs> yeah, I would like that too, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there should be like a very big pet food database or something where companies keep updating their information, but <laughs> maybe too much to ask. But yeah. Cats have been referred to as obligate carnivores. Yeah. Should we feed obligate carnivores carbohydrates? 
Um, you, when a, a cat doesn't need an obligate carnivore, um, but when we're looking at the pet foods, um, they are really supplementing the things that are, are lacking. We're making up for that by adding vitamin and mineral supplements or by adding extra taurine to the diet, extra other essential amino acids. So by using these synthetic supplements, you can really kind of balance it out and make sure that all the nutrients are there. Um, if you're really referring to, does a cat need a low carb carbohydrate diet all the time throughout their life? One of the things that I really like considering is the very different lifestyle that our cats have that are currently living in our household compared to the cats that are living in the wild. Cats in the wild are constantly in gestation lactation. It's about survival of the fittest. So they have a very high protein need, a very high fat need just because of being growing all the time, growing tissue all the time. While the cats that we have in our household, we're spay neutering them. They're indoors all the time, they're lazy, they're laying on the couch 23 hours per day sleeping. That's a completely different lifestyle and I'm sure those cats don't have the same um, nutrient needs as the ones that are very active hunting in the wild. So we, I think we're looking at, the, it's still a cat, but we're looking at, um, we're looking at a couch, a human couch potato who's laying on the couch in front of the TV with a bag of chips all the time. And then on the other hand, an Olympic athlete. So, yes, too much fat. Like when, once you're giving fat at a percentage over 25% for a, on a dry matter basis for a long time, it will cause insulin resistance. And that's a rule for all animals. That's, uh, that's what, what is happening in humans as well. Uh, as I say, all nutrients have, in a way, an effect on insulin resistance. It's really a very complex, uh, complex matter. Uh, but the carbohydrates, especially when you're giving the simple sugars, that will be the worst, uh, the worst thing. Also, when it comes to um, obesity, which nutrient is causing obesity? all of them are causing obesity. It's not really what you are feeding, it's how much you are feeding. Um, so fat is very easily stored as fat. Carbohydrates, if there's an excess, is converted to fat and stored as fat. Protein, don't think you're getting muscle from eating more protein. Excess protein is converted to fat and stored as fat. So from all the three big groups, an excess of it will always lead to fat storage and will always lead to weight gain. Um, so it's really about more about the amount rather than um, the actual nutrients. Yeah. Okay, I think I should give the floor to Dr. Dursey. I don't want to go too much over time. Yeah, I still have to. Okay, good evening. Can you hear me there? That's good. Okay, so uh, I've got about 25 minutes. I talk pretty fast and I think everybody's getting a little tired. So I'm gonna try to go through, th through this fairly quickly. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, and welcome Dr. Tom Gibson here from the OVC Surgery Service. And he'll be here to answer any questions that you may have regarding exercise. He doesn't know that, but he is. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about exercise in pets. Really, it can be summarized fairly easily. We don't actually need to look at too much research. People are lazy, they don't walk their dogs, they need to walk their dogs, and therefore they would not be as overweight as they are. There is no doubt, no doubt at all, that nutrition plays a huge part, but certainly with our sedentary lifestyle, um, we do find that a lot of people um, are either incapable or unwilling to walk their pets as much as possible. And we'll talk a little bit about cats as well. So we do have an inactivity problem, and certainly our North American lifestyle does uh, translate into that uh, lifestyle with our pets because, of course, we control the exercise that they have. And certainly, um, as practicing veterinarians, um, and I practice every day at the, uh, the rehab service, um, it's interesting when you start to ask people about what type of exercise um, they, uh, they do with their pets. And this is particularly important in rehab when we're looking at a return to function uh, and we're trying to determine the goals uh, for these particular pets. 
there's no doubt that we do have some pets that are returned to lifestyle for them means running 25 kilometers or maybe they're a police dog or a sport dog but certainly for the average pet um, I'm pretty startled at actually how little people do uh, exercise their pets and I don't think I really realized that until I started asking. So as uh, Dr. Verbrugge uh, uh, mentioned and Dr. Talgavriel, there are many, many benefits uh, to exercise. We know that if we can raise uh, the daily energy, um, or sorry, if we can uh, diminish the, uh, the energy expenditure, or increase the energy expenditure, then of course we'll contribute to weight loss. Um, and certainly there are some metabolic reasons why exercise can be very important. It can contribute to, um, uh, to uh, losing uh, a weight, preventing regain, um, and also it can help with glucose homeostasis and insulin sensitivity. It can improve mobility, reduce pain and lameness, and certainly suppress some of those pro-inflammatory agents that Dr. Verbrugge was talking about. So lots of benefits with exercise. Um, interestingly, a lot of this information um, does, is uh, extrapolated actually from, from human uh, medicine. And in fact, there's not a lot of studies regarding exercise uh, in, uh, in pets. When we look at the research, a lot of the exercise research comes from, from not necessarily inactivity or in inactive animals, uh, but rather those that are very active like sled dogs, hunting dogs, um, racing greyhounds. And one thing that we do find is, is absent in the literature is how many kilocalories are actually expended by simple activities. So for instance, um, you know, and there's lots of information and people about how many kilocalories there you will lose by running um, a certain amount or going on the treadmill or the Stairmaster or whatnot. But certainly for pets, there's not a lot of information available. Um, it is uh, estimated that, uh, that pets will burn 1.1 kilocalories per kilo per kilometer at a brisk walking pace of about 10 to 10.5 minutes per kilometer. So that's about uh, six kilometers a half hour. So again, when you're talking about um, um, gaining a history from our clients, it's really important to find out how much they're walking or how much exercise and it's uh, a little depressing at times, as we all know, how many, uh, how little or few calories uh, we burn by doing certain activities. And that's true for our pets as well. So there's some interesting research, Morrison et al. in 2013, and then also followed up in 2014, um, use uh, an interesting instrument here called an actigraph, uh, which is, uh, they were measuring accelerometry. They were trying to determine um, about activity in pets and obesity, and if there was association and certainly from the human literature, we know that it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, the less active you are, the more, more obese you are, the more obese you are, the less likely you're to, get, to gain uh, or to perform physical activity. And so they actually did uh, determine that in pets. And the thought process was, is that if we could increase, um, sorry, activity um, in pets, and sorry, I'm missing the slide, um, would that actually um, uh, help and we did find from the research, uh, or sorry, they did find from the research that in fact, because humans actually control the amount of activity in our pets, that there may not be such association. So what does that mean? It really means that as veterinarians, um, unlike ourselves, we choose to be less active or we choose to be more active. Um, our pets really may not have that choice. And that's something that as practicing veterinarians that we need to put some pressure um, on our clients to initiate in physical activity. Um, interestingly, uh, LifeLearn is introducing a new um, uh, type of uh, technology called uh, the voice uh, where the pets can actually wear this collar um, and it may help us to determine um, some wellness uh, and there's wellness monitoring associated with it. And so although I think there's more and Tom might know a little bit more about this particular device, um, it appears that it may help to motivate people insofar as understanding the heart rate of their pet and respiratory rate, but also trying to determine the amount of kilocalories um, that are um, expended and uh, potentially that could help to motivate some people um, to lose weight. Just as you'll see the different Fitbits and different technologies that uh, may motivate people, perhaps there's a future in that for our pets. So with, uh, this is the second study, and I'm sorry because my slides were a little bit messed up there, um, that sort of demonstrates that, um, that physical activity, again, um, is determined by our, our actual, the, the owners, the clients, and as veterinarians, maybe we need to put a little bit more pressure on clients um, to perform more physical activity with their pets and to make them understand what the health benefits are. 
there is a lot of research um, in the human, actually, uh, uh, medicine world about the benefits of dog walking. And certainly it's one of the easier activities that we can encourage our clients to, um, uh, to participate in. Um, interestingly, when you um, speak to clients in the exam room and ask them, well, how much do you actually exercise your pet? Um, studies suggest that people will ex exaggerate those um, estimations by 30 to 300 percent. And uh, uh, I must say myself, I probably do that as well. Uh, my dad calls me every Sunday and he's a big exercise uh, person. And so uh, there's no doubt that it's fairly easy to uh, increase the estimation. And, and certainly it's very possible that our clients may not be telling the truth. So most dog owners do believe that there is a benefit. Um, it's a matter of us putting some pressure on. Um, it is estimated in the literature that only 60% of dog owners walk their dogs regularly. Um, and certainly, uh, as we know as Canadians, the winter's been pretty bad. Um, you talk to your clients right now and say, well, how did the winter fare for your dog? We're doing physical exams during heartworm season now. Um, and it's not uncommon for people to suggest, you know what, it's been a tough winter. I haven't been doing a lot of walking. And I think we can all agree we're still waiting for the sun to come out. So certainly in Canada, that must uh, contribute. Uh, as an aside, uh, we also in Canada, certainly we see in North America, a lot of people that are weekend warriors. So they do are very inactive during the week. And then all of a sudden on the weekend, they go for some 20 kilometer um, um, hike or walk. In fact, I just had a client last week that came in whose husband um, actually was training for the Boston Marathon. And this poor lab had probably not gone for too many walks over the winter time and had a bunch of sores uh, on his feet or a bit of road burn because he went 25K and probably hasn't done anything over the winter time. So uh, a lot of people will also mistake um, do, uh, confinement in the yard as exercise. I think when you say to your clients, well, you know, are you actually walking your dog? I think you need to be fairly specific about what exercise means. A lot of people feel that if you just open up the, do the, the, the backyard and let them run around, that that contributes to exercise. And, and I'm not entirely sure that it does. So um, regarding dog walking, um, there is evidence to support that dog ownership is associated with higher levels of physical activity than those that actually don't have dogs. Um, and again, um, if, uh, if people feel obligated to walk their dog, they may be able to participate a little bit more. Um, one of the interesting things I found when preparing for this lecture is there's not actually a lot of information on general health guidelines. How much should I walk, walk my dog? Um, there really isn't a lot of available information. Um, unlike the, the human Canadian health guidelines that suggest you know, 30 minutes of activity, I think it's four or five times a week, um, we can suggest the similar type of activity for our pets, but we actually don't know. Um, and I started actually in my exam room saying that to people, well, how much do you exercise? And you should be, and I recommend that you do 30 minutes of exercise with your pet five times a week. And uh, I was pretty startled at how shocking that information <laughs> was to people um, and how people were really kind of um, alarmed that they needed to exercise their dogs that much. Um, certainly, um, if we can also increase information to our clients about different uh, um, facilities, different programs, off-leash parks, off-leash areas that may contribute some kind of social connection or so social interaction that may help them to exercise a little bit more. So we know that dogs that are overweight are exercised less frequently, and uh, the research suggests that younger dogs are often walked more frequently. And I think as Dr. Verbrugge um, uh, um, mentioned, um, that that one year wait can be very important. Maybe that's a good time for us to check in and say, hey, let's keep walking that dog just because he's over a year of age, don't stop walking. Um, and uh, uh, the, the one uh, research paper that I read um, discussed that there's no association with demographics. It didn't seem to matter what gender, age, education, or income. Um, uh, again, only 60% of dog owners really walk their dogs. Um, and certainly that we know that obese um, owners are less likely to walk their dog. And I think certainly talking to practitioners, it's always a bit horrifying for us when we have to mention to an obese client um, that their dog or their cat is also obese and that maybe there could be some benefits from, from exercising um, and certainly nutritional recommendations. 
So how do we get people to walk their dogs? According to West Garth in 2014, we need to make them feel obliged. We, make, we, need, we need to make them feel guilty and, uh, uh, you know, try your best. <laughs> um, and certainly we need to support the physical environments and certainly um, try to uh, encourage them maybe to go to off-leash uh, zones uh, or potentially walking in safe areas. Um, but certainly there's no doubt that as practitioners, um, we're doing pretty good at talking about nutrition these days, but probably uh, not so great at asking about exercise. And we know that there's a lot of benefit to exercising. So this, uh, um, uh, Westgarth et al. had this fancy graph and basically um, the intention to walk was very important, but again, uh, making people feel obliged was one of the most important things that we can do. So add on that guilt. So what do we do? How do we intervene? How do we encourage people to exercise? Um, I would propose that the sixth vital sign should be exercise. Uh, I think what we need to do is we need to be asking more in our history. I know that some of our exams can be fairly quick, but when you're asking about diet, why not just pop in there and say, well, how much do you exercise your pet? Did you know you should exercise at least 30 minutes, four to five times a week, and uh, start that con a conversation? We need to encourage physical activity. Um, it should be a part of the exam. And certainly we need to lay on that guilt and we need to make them feel obliged uh, to take their animals for a walk. Um, there is an interesting initiative here at the University of Guelph and certainly there's a number of different universities that are actually participating. Um, it's called Exercises Medicine. Um, the website is on here and I'm happy to provide it. Um, this particular group of healthcare professionals, which are mainly human, in fact, I think we're the only veterinary group that is associated, uh, feels that you should physically write a prescription for exercise. Um, so get out that, ex that, that uh, prescription paper and write on it, walk your dog. Um, and if that's not possible, I'll talk in a second about some other things that you can do. Um, so definitely try prescribing exercise for health benefits. Um, for those that need a more formalized program and certainly that have other conditions, um, you can refer to a canine rehab uh, therapist or practitioner. Um, certainly we have here in Guelph our OVC Fitness and Rehab Service. Um, there are certain uh, facilities, uh, programs um, that offer fat camps. Why not start a fat camp at your clinic? Um, you can uh, actually have it for dogs or for cats. Maybe it's something where they check in a couple of times a week. Um, maybe it's where a group of people walk together. Um, or um, in extreme cases, and we certainly have this at the fitness and rehab center, um, where we can actually house your pet for a couple of weeks and get them started um, um, for um, some serious, serious weight loss and exercise. Um, maybe at your clinic you can actually have a wall of fame. Take some before and after pictures. Find out what motivates people. Um, there are some uh, places that will actually have like a Biggest Loser type competition, that uh, TV show. Um, see if you can get people competing against each other. Um, or maybe it is on Saturday or Sunday mornings where you organize a community walk that starts out of your practice. Uh, be creative. Try to put an emphasis. Spring and fall are great times to initiate programs. There's no doubt that winter is a challenge here in Canada and certainly in this area for all of us. When you start an exercise program, certainly I'm not suggesting that like this Boston Marathon participant that you start out and go do 25 kilometers. Um, there is not a lot of information um, about how to start an exercise program in pets. Um, having said that, it would be very reasonable to start most pets um, with a, a five to 10 minute walk, um, increasing to 15 to 30 minutes and working towards 30 to 60 minutes. Um, the suggestion is that you add five minutes uh, per week. And of course, um, this is for pets that may not have uh, uh, other conditions. It's important to realize that if they also are suffering from a cruciate injury or a back injury um, or other medical conditions, um, that we need to be mindful of that. Again, knowing that uh, as depressing as it is, 1.1 kilocalorie per kilo per kilometer is suggested uh, to be what we burn or what the pets will burn in a 10 to 20, uh, 10 5 minute per, per kilometer walk. And if you, it's easy to calculate, um, certainly if you share that with the people, I mean, I'm sure we've all done it before. I know how long it takes for me to go on the treadmill so that I can eat a donut. Um, and it certainly makes me run a little bit longer at times. So I think if we share that with people, it might be motivating. 
Um, there's no doubt that underwater treadmill and, and some uh, rehab equipment can be very helpful for some pets that have um, concurrent uh, problems or pr potentially um, are just very, very obese that walking um, is not um, um, something that, um, um, that they're able to do or perhaps we need to kickstart that program a little bit more uh, formalized. Um, and so certainly with underwater treadmills, we've got the incorporation of water, which reduces the joint load, can be helpful for those that have arthritis or are so um, obese, um, and uh, also increases the resistance. Um, it's not exactly known how many kilocalories are burnt in a treadmill, um, but I know that University of Florida, they're doing some research on that. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of anything, Tom, but um, um, this is one of the areas where it'd be interesting to find out some more information because we really don't know how much, uh, how much uh, energy is is, is expended and, and how much you need to do to lose some weight. Um, so exercise programs, so formalized ones are also available. Um, certainly um, uh, there's the Canine Fit Club. I don't know if anybody's aware of that. It's a program out of the States where uh, medical um, or um, animal hospital um, members um, can actually take a course on how to conduct an exercise class with pets. Um, so you can see here where this dog is sitting on top of this lady's back and the thought process there is to encourage people to exercise with their pets. Um, again, it might be a neat way as a community event, neat way to get people um, you know, excited about exercise and you never know, you might have some technicians or other um, support workers that uh, may be interested in, in, in running a program like that through your hospital. Um, things like agility, fly ball, obedience training, they can all be helpful in losing calories and keeping animals fit. Um, dog walkers are also available for those that cannot walk or doggy daycare. I think the idea is to get everybody active and we know that the more active we are, the more uh, likely we are to lose weight and keep it off. So what do we do about our overweight cats? I've spent a lot of time talking about dog walking. Um, this is a 15 kilo cat, almost 15 kilo cat, so we didn't quite get there. Um, but um, what do we do about these, about these patients? Um, this is an easy conversation, walk your dog. I don't know too many people that can walk their cats. Um, and it's a good question. Um, it is uh, certainly, there's the um, uh, Oklahoma State University has their indoor pet initiative. If you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to check out that website. Um, but we know from research that cats are better at short bursts of energy rather than long endurance. I do have one client that puts their cat regularly on the treadmill and I just think that's so impressive. Um, we have very few and we have put cats in the underwater treadmill but they're generally not too happy about that. Um, so, uh, so certainly things like running up and down the stairs, laser pointers, uh, and I think Dr. Verbug had a very good uh, comment about nothing free. Uh, try to get them to, uh, to eat out of food bowls um, and uh, try to get them active a little bit. And I think again, trying to prevent it um, is going to be the big key. So very quickly, I'll just, I have a couple of case studies, but maybe we'll just go through one quick one um, here, uh, just because we're getting close to time. Um, this is a pet actually that I just saw today. Um, Dr. Gibson did the surgery here and it's very successful, I may say. So this is six-year-old Sterina, standard poodle, right hind TPLO performed, cruciate ligament injury, recovering well. Uh, when she came to us, she was four weeks post-op and she was already doing 10 minute walks twice a day on a leash, very good idea. Um, I body conditioner score at an eight out of nine and I'll tell you a second what her real body condition score is. I'm a little easy. And uh, her muscle condition score was moderate muscle loss on the, uh, on the uh, affected limb. And she had a four centimeter difference between the left and right. And I'm happy to say that after a month that we're um, only two centimeter difference at the moment. So I did my good old uh, body condition scoring. So it's important to note that with the morphometric measurements, you do, need, do you do need to identify that they are a four out of five or at least a six out of nine um, on the uh, Wasava body condition score chart before you can even partake in the morphometric measurements. If they are actually the ideal body weight, this will not work, this calculation will not work. So she is 35.3 kilos, the calculated um, ideal, sorry, I should use my pointer here. Um, I think I just used this, right? Do I press the green button? No, I don't know how to do this. Because I'm red, sorry. Okay, sorry, oh, uh-oh. Okay, there we go. Sorry, not the arrows. Okay, we'll try this again. So her current weight is 35.3. Um, using this, we remember we want to be our body fat percentage is about 20-25%. We're 48.7. Ideal body weight should be 22.6. And uh, we wrote down here that she should have 726 kilocalories per day. Um, so interestingly, um, after discussion uh, with Dr. Verbrugge, it turns out that I'm a little bit easy. I thought I was tough, but I guess I'm not. 
um, did I body condition score Serena properly using the Wasava chart? And the question is, no, I actually didn't. Um, it, she is a nine out of nine, so that could have had an implications had I tried to calculate it properly. I think there's no doubt that she knows that she's overweight. Um, and I guess the second question is, do, the, do I believe the morphometric measurements or do the people? And if we go back up, just recall that this 35.3 kilo dog has come in to me and I'm now telling them it should weigh 22 kilos. Um, for those that have used the morphometric measurements, I think we can all share that there are times where the, the clients are astonished um, or they don't believe it. Um, it's not possible. My dog's never been that weight. Um, but I assure you that this dog should weigh that. And I assure you that in this particular case, that this dog is a nine and a nine and very, very heavy. And if we continue like that, either we're going to blow the next um, cruciate, which we might do anyway, and Dr. Gibson will see Serena again. Um, so certainly getting the weight off is an important part of rehab. And it's great that we've got this fancy underwater treadmill and we can do a lot of therapeutic exercises. But as a veterinarian and even as the family veterinarian for this uh, particular pet, I think getting the weight off is really, really important to the recovery and also really, really important to, uh, to future issues. So the clients had a hard time believing me that the dog should be 22 kilo. And in fact, until uh, last week, um, refused to go to a weight loss diet. They just decided to decrease their um, own diet, be a little bit more mindful of caloric um, uh, requirements. And so we weighed the dog today and she has lost a little bit since we saw her last week, uh, but certainly plateaued and really didn't lose anything from the time we saw her six weeks ago until now. So we switched her over to the Hills Metabolic. Um, we hope that the people um, um, will um, continue with the weight loss program. And certainly since we see this pet twice a week, it's easy for us to keep tabs on the, on the actual weight. Um, and so certainly from, from their perspective, it's an interesting one where I feel like I'm fairly, I give all the information. I feel like I've correctly uh, identified to them that the pet is overweight. I've indicated to them that the pet store brand is not going to do it. And yet the people refuse to, um, uh, to change to a, uh, a prescription diet. Now they have, we hope that we're on the right, uh, right track. Um, am I recommending the correct amount of food? Certainly with the um, morphometric measurements, it kind of pops out if you go to the healthy weight protocol. We often double check it by doing the actual calculations that Dr. Verbrugge has uh, explained to you, and uh, it should be correct. Of course, what we can't um, um, help is how much they are actually feeding insofar as treats and whatnot. So we've been pretty strict with that. Um, and what are my exercise recommendations? Because we do think that that will um, help with weight loss. And I think one of the questions that we have to, and actually we were talking about this in rehab the other day, is do I think that 10 minute walks, you know, twice a day over the course of a week or a month, um, are they going to contribute significantly to weight loss? And the answer is probably not a lot, as we discussed a little bit before about how many kilocalories you actually burn. But my, um, my push would be is that if we can start conditioning this pet so that by the time this TPLO has healed, that we can now graduate to the recommendations of 30 minutes five times a week, I feel that that will help to contribute to the weight loss. And you can't go from zero to 60 um, overnight. So certainly, although it's a slow climb, um, I do feel like the exercise, of course, is going to help build muscle mass. Um, but as well, we hope that it will put the dog in a condition um, where it can better exercise and lose weight in the future. So um, at this time, we were doing 10 minute walks. We're building towards, I think today he said he's doing uh, 20 minute walks. Dog's doing well, building muscle. We hope to lose weight. We're doing some other exercises um, and uh, we hope that the pet will do well. So I think we'll leave it there. I do have another case study, but I think that's, uh, that's fine. It is getting late. Um, is there any questions or any comments that, um, for myself, Dr. Gibson from the surgery service, Dr. Verbrug uh, from nutrition? Does it make you want to go home and just start walking your dog? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. So.
one of the things that you have to keep in mind is also that the healthy weight protocol is more accurate the fatter the animal is. So if you have an animal that is only a six out of nine, there can be quite an underestimation of that ideal body weight. So make sure that if you see that ideal body weight and you still kind of look at the animal and look at the number and think, is this something that is realistic? Um, when the patient is a 9 out of 9, then most probably those measurements will be quite accurate. My own cat was a 6 out of 9, and I was actually one of those astonished clients that all of a sudden saw a number. Your cat, should, she was a 4.5 kilograms, and the number says that the cat should be 2.3 kilograms. I put my cat on a weight loss diet. I didn't believe the healthy weight loss protocol and just went with my own calculations for 3.5 kilograms, and she lost 2% of her body weight per week. So if I would have gone with 2.3 kilograms, as the program says, the weight loss might have gone too quickly for a cat. So make sure, especially in those animals that are only slightly overweight, um, that you double check um, the body weight, the ideal body weight that comes out, because often it is on the rest of the weight. So that's why in our clinical nutrition service, we tend to use it especially for the nine out of nines, because at that point, um, it's like 40, more than 40% fat, but you don't know how much it really is, so that's really the fact that you will be able to So I sort of get questions that are up to 6 out of 9, or anywhere below 9 out of 9? 30% 30%? And I mean, sorry, yeah, you can just, just to clarify too, I know a lot of our clients have these in the clinic, but I found, I just came out of practice, so I found that for my minimally overweight pets, so in the 20 to 30% body fat, I'd often use just this chart, as opposed to the healthy weight protocol. So, oh, sorry, I can shout. <laughs> no, but I, um, I find that the chart is, I don't think that's actually on. I find that the chart is a little bit more accurate that way when you're, when you're under the six, six, seven, nine, which is a 30% body fat score. So you can just flip it over and use the cheat sheet. It'll tell you what they weigh now and what they need to be weighing. As simple as that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then everything that is lower, you can either use the, the charts or you can do your body condition score and relate it to the 25%. Any other questions for Penny? One of the things you could do is, is show them like the calorie calculations, like this is what your cat needs and this is what is actually in the food. So yes, this is, this is enough. The other thing that I often have to do is just point people out that cats, small dogs, they don't have the same size as human beings. Like people just want to feed so much food, but the tiny little animals that really don't need a lot. Like a cat typically, if you're feeding only dry food, it's like 50, 60 gram per day. It's not a lot. Like I weigh my cat's food every morning. It's it's not a lot of food, um, but that's that's what they need. And I think a lot of clients are panicking if they're not eating a lot. Uh, but as long as their body weight remains healthy, um, they're really eating enough to maintain their body weight. So, so that's the the most important thing. I think. Well, thank you on behalf of um, all of us here at OBC for attending tonight. Um, and as well, we'd like to thank again Hills as our sponsor. Um, hope you all have a good evening. And if there's any other questions, you're welcome to come up and talk to us personally. So have a good night.